The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. One time I know MIT did a study how many signatures it took to appoint a student as a graduate research assistant, and it was 18. Okay, so lean thinking very much applies not just to defense aircraft, which a lot of it you heard about, but to a lot of other situations, including education. And uh, that's an opportunity. If you think it's hard to change aerospace companies, and now we're doing healthcare, it's going to be even harder to change education because faculty members are not uh, very flexible on these kinds of things. So, but maybe in time we will. Okay, so what we're going to do in this module is to look into some of the fundamental principles of lean thinking. So we've had a couple introductory modules. Now we're actually going to get down to, to a little bit more what are the fundamentals. So we're going to look at, at the end of this module, you should be able to describe what are the basic elements of a process. You will be able to draw a process map. We're going to, you're going to draw a process map as an exercise. You should be able to explain what constitutes value. George already talked a lot about that but we'll be a little bit more specific. Then there are five fundamental principles of lean thinking. They're very, fairly simple, common sense, but very powerful to internalize. And then we're going to talk about some tools for implementing lean thinking. Your, George already mentioned value stream maps. We're going to, we won't do that till this afternoon, but that's a very uh, powerful tool. But we'll look at some simpler tools. OK, process, pretty simple. A series of actions, changes, or functions which brings about a result, okay? And so you got every process has some inputs. There's a process which changes those inputs into some useful output. So let me give you a simple example you can all re relate to. Doing a homework problem, okay? What are your inputs for a homework problem? Greg? It's out of a book. You know, okay. You. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Maggie? Um, yeah. Other yeah. Other and maybe you got some requirements from somebody who wants you to do that imp that homework problem. You know, here's the assumptions, or here's what. You, okay. And then what do you do? Well, you have some kind of way of taking those inputs and generating. Now, what's the output of a homework problem? Christopher. Solution. Solution. Okay. And what do you do with that? Turn it in, right, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. And so you got, you know, if you think about how you do a homework problem, you probably have developed some kind of process for doing that. Nobody, you might even be taught that, you know, but, you know, maybe you read it carefully, what, you know, what's required, maybe you do it with somebody else, maybe you check the answers, you know, you got some kind of process to do that. That's a, that's a process. Now, what we're gonna talk about processes that involve a lot of people. Um, George? In one of your radars, how many people might be involved in, in say, d these are engineers. How many people might be involved in the engineering of a radar system? The developmental upfront work? Yeah. Well, 50 or 60 overall? 50 or 60 people. Okay, that's fairly small, actually. Al, for the F-18, how many F-18 EF, how many people might be involved? 1,500. 1,500, okay. So we're talking about processes where you got a lot of people involved, okay? Not just one person working a homework problem, but it's the same concept, okay? So, so you have to go about it the right way. Okay, so we've already talked about this. What happens to the output of the process? We call the person that that goes to the customer, okay? So in your homework problem, Chris, your customer is your faculty member or TA or whoever you're giving it to. And what do you want to do to that customer? You want to Please them, right, <laughs> okay? You want to delight them, right? You want them to come back and say, Christopher, this is not an A, it's an A plus, okay? Okay, that's your customer, okay? Now, George talked about customers for the radar. Lockheed was the customer for their radar system, okay? That, that kind of customer we call an external customer, okay? That's the person who typically is giving you money for something, okay? That's pretty important. Okay, if they don't give you money for it, whoever your company is isn't going to be around too long. George mentioned Westinghouse, 
was making tons of money from their customer until they got into some trouble. Okay. Now, there's actually a difference between the end user and the customer. Okay, so if we're making commercial airplanes, the customer might be the airlines, but the end user is who? The passenger, the mechanic, the pilot. Okay, so, so they don't pay for the airplane, but they're the ones that use it. So uh, now in that case, they actually don't pay for the airplane. In some other cases, the end user may actually pay and consume the product. Okay. You know, I'm the end user of the, of the water bottle. But there's some difference between in, end, user and, end users and customers, but there's somebody who's paying for what you're doing and you want to please them, or somebody who's using what you're producing and you want to please them. But many of the customers you guys will work for, very few of you will probably end up handing the airplane over or the satellite or the avionics system to the paying customer. Okay, that'd be unusual. Some of you may, you may be the CEO or something, but, but you'll probably be, as an engineer, you'll probably be turning that over to somebody who's going to build it or test it or something. Okay, so that's your customer, and that's what we call an internal customer. And typically, they don't give you money, but they're the ones who receive your work. Now, what do you think you have if you have a process that has no customer? Are you going to be adding value? Okay. If nobody wants what you're doing, probably not. Okay, so. So everybody who's doing something that's value added is going to have a customer who's the next person in the sequence of what they're doing. Okay, and not only do customers receive what you're doing, but as we said in the homework problem, they give you some of the inputs. They give you the specifications or the delivery schedule. So the customers not only receive the output, but can give you some of the input. Okay, so we have a process and yeah, I was just going to say that one of the good examples of that, that most folks, most folks don't think of it, is car dealerships, because most folks think of you coming in to buy the car as the customer. When in fact, when they were trying to deploy OnStar, the real reality of it was people only bought the cars that the dealers were buying from the manufacturer. So they had to redo a bunch of that to force it down through the dealership. So that end user vice yeah. customer discussion is valuable. Yeah, the, yeah, there's a difference between the end user and the customer. Not always, but I mean, there can be. Sometimes they're the same. Okay, now a, a good way to understand a process is to draw a map, and that's going to be our next exercise. We're actually going to map out a, a process. This is, don't try to read all this, it's, it's made, made so you can't read it. But this is an actual process map uh, from a, one of our LAI companies on the process they used to do a release of a drawing after it was drawn, the, you know, the check off inspection process and you know you know what's your first impression of that process it's it's kind of complicated doesn't it okay I mean look at this thing here huh this goes here and this goes here and I can't find where this goes everything goes oh here it goes here okay <laughs> okay but anyway it's it's a vis so a process map is a visualization a visual image of it and when you're involving 50 people or 1500 people very few of those 50 people know what the other person's doing unless you try to map it out and show it to them. And that, that's what leads to this value stream map, which George mentioned. So the only way you can improve a process is to understand, understand it. You can't improve it if you don't understand it. So one of the things about lean thinking is we start with where we're at, the current state, George said, and we try to improve it. We don't throw it out and reinvent the wheel and start with something completely untested. We start with where we're at, we try to, we, being the people doing it, the frontline workers, the Joe Taylors, try to improve it and then improve it again and again. And the way to improve it is to understand it. Okay, and it's easier to understand if you can visualize it. It's pretty hard if I tried to describe this process to you in words or a long document it was like, but it's much easier if you can visualize it. And a process map is just an organized visualization of all the interrelated activities which, when combined, are that set of activities that change an input to an output. Okay, and that's called a process map. Okay, any of you ever heard this word process map before? No? Yeah, Doug. Okay. You know, this is remarkable. Okay? And this is why we're teaching this class. I mean, 
I love teaching aerodynamics. That's what I taught here uh, for many years. But when you guys get out and try to apply that aerodynamics to an aerospace problem, you're going to be in the, in the midst of one of these processes. And we don't teach anything about processes at MIT except here. Okay? And about half of what you need to know is this kind of stuff, and the other half is the aerodynamics. Okay, so let's talk, let's look at a, this is a, a very simple process to fix a hot dog. Now, no one would ever map this out because you know how to fix hot dogs, okay? So, but, okay, we, we want them to fix a hot dog, and so here's the process map, and here's some symbology, and we'll go back and forth. So we start with a customer, and that customer gives an, an order. In case if it's you, you're probably giving it to yourself, but, you know, it may be your roommate or wife or boyfriend or whatever. You know, I want a hot dog. Okay, so we use, we, we're going to use a kind of a broken arrow like that to show information flow. So then we get here, we got an order for a hot dog. So we need to find, do we have a hot dog and we have a bun to, to, to give that? So that's the first question. Do we have any hot dogs? If the answer is yes, do we need, I'm sorry, do we need a hot dog? If the answer is yes, we have to go to the store and get that hot dog before we can start to cook it. Okay, you might think of this as being going to your supplier. If the answer is no, we don't need a hot dog, we have one in inventory, that's inventory, go to the pantry, we'll get it, the bun or the refrigerator, whatever, and, uh, and then we can start cooking the hot dog. So first we've got to get the raw materials, the input for our process. So we've got information, we've got some raw materials. Then we're using these kind of double arrows to show that this is the main process flow. Now what's flowing in this process? The hot dog is flowing, okay? So we cook the hot dog, that's a task. We put it in the bun and add the condiments, that's another task. And then we deliver the order to the customer. Okay? But things aren't finished yet. Okay? We want to do a little cleanup to get ready for the next, what do we call, in the lean thinking, what do we call this part of it here? 5S. Okay, we do a little 5S, kind of clean things up. Then we ask, is that the last hot dog and bun we have in the pantry? If the answer is yes, what do we do? We make a shopping list. Now you've actually heard this in a different term this morning, but probably haven't connected the dot yet. Anybody recognize what this might be in terms of something Al mentioned in his lecture? This is a Kanban. Okay, this is a list that we're now out of hot dogs and we need some more hot dogs. And we'll come back to that a little bit later in the lecture, but it's Kanban. So we, we add it to our shopping list because now we know we need some more, and then we stop. Okay, so that's a simple process map. And in, in doing these, since you're working with multiple people, you have to agree on, on some terminology, just like in the aerodynamics class, you have to agree that alpha stands for angle of attack, or structures class that L stands for the length of the beam. Otherwise, you can't communicate with each other. When you work together as a group, you have to agree on some, some kind of symbols for these things. And these are not unique, there are different ways you can do it, but, but these are some ones uh, that are typically done. So this is the main process flow, this is a secondary or feeder flow, this is information flow. So this means, you know, we're, we're getting something which is contributing to the main flow. We have a warehouse, we have a task, we have inventory, we have a decision. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you to open your folder and pull out something called Sasha and Andy's hot dog stand. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's in the right side of your folder. It should be uh, right behind your 5S or right behind your enterprise speaker notes. Okay, so Sasha and Andy have a hot dog stand that they've set up at their local park and they offer a hot dog with a choice of fresh fruit and a beverage to any of the walk-up customers in the park between 10 and 2. And the customers, uh, they set out condiments. The customers put their own condiments on. And the feedback they're getting is the customers like the hot dogs. They're saying it's awful. They have to wait an awful long time to get it. So they've been doing this for two weeks, making some summer money. And they notice they're barely keeping up with the customer demand. And they're making a little money. And they'd like to improve their process because they, they can see that the demand is growing. And so at the end of the week, they, they sat down and came up with these 11 steps in their process and they've got some data for each of the each of the steps. Now uh, we're going to start by working with just the process steps. 
when you start adding the data, then you get to what we call a value stream map, and we'll be doing that later on. So right now we want to look at the process. And so here's our, our, our exercise. We got four tables. We got four um, easel charts. We got some post-its for you. And uh, Hugh is going to describe how to use those in a minute here. And so what you want to do is to, is to write down the process steps on the post-its and to organize them. Uh, it's nice. It turns out it's better if you do these things with post-its because, you know, you can move them around until you arrive at what you decide your process map is. So you put those post-its on the easel chart, and then you're going to draw some lines to, to, to map out this process. And what I want to point out is don't get hung up on the symbology. The symbology is only a means to an end. So if you want to use a little different symbology, that's fine. Don't, you know, we gave you some to use, but you don't have to feel constrained by that. And you want to identify what are the inputs and the outputs of the process. And to do that, you have to understand what the boundary of the process is, what's you know, within the process and what's outside the process. And then we're going to ask you to uh, present your process map to the rest of the class and explain it. OK? So this will take about 15 minutes uh, altogether. We'll give about 10 minutes to do the process map. If you need a little bit more time, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. And then in about five minutes to report out. So just to wrap up this introduction to processes, processes really underlay everything we do. I mean, you know, there's this phrase, if I have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, if you start abstracting what you do in life, you can abstract almost anything to it's a process, okay? And uh, it turns out this is critically important, okay? Process thinking is critically important to, uh, to improvement. So fundamentals of lean thinking are, are the foundations of modern process improvement. And you'll hear this word a lot, process improvement. And so understanding and improving processes is the key step to this kind of productivity which George was talking about and Al's been talking about. Okay. And it's not, it's, what's important to realize is it's not that the people are not capable. Most people that you hire are actually quite capable of doing something. Maybe not what you have them doing, but they're quite capable of doing something. It's that you immerse them in a system, as George said, which is not efficient, and that's the process level. Okay. So lean thinking is not about beating up people. Okay. It's about giving those people an efficient process so that they can be productive. OK, now with that, we're going to now take segue to these five fundamental principles of lean thinking. And these were articulated in the book by Jim Womack and Dan Jones. The first thing is understand what is value. And value is defined by the customer in terms of specific products and services. For engineers, this is very hard to think about value because there are no units that go with it. You know, it's not like speed or mass or volts or something, okay? okay. There are no units to go with value, yet each of us makes value decisions every day. You made a value decision to come take this course. Okay. However you did that, you decided this course was going to be valuable enough you wanted to come, come take it. Okay. You're, the customer, you're our customers for this course, and we're going to keep asking you, are you satisfied? How can you help us improve it? So value is defined by the customer. Once we understand what value is, then we talk about a value stream. And George mentioned value stream mapping. Okay. And these are the value stream are the end-to-end -end actions that you've just mapped out and processes and functions that transform the inputs to the outputs. And what we want to do is identify what in that stream is value added and what's not value added. Okay. So you can think of it, there are a bunch, the customer says, I want something. There are a bunch of steps to do that. Now I'll tell you a little quick story here. Boeing, when Boeing Commercial Airplanes started thinking of, in terms of these things, I was told by a friend there that they started with that their output is to deliver an airplane to a customer. And they started mapping backwards all the activities they did to develop that airplane back to the front. And then they compared that with what they actually did. So this is the things they need to do to deliver that product, but what do we actually do? And they found out about 50% of the things they did to develop that airplane added no value in the eyes of the customer. 50%. Okay. 
OK, so once you understand that value stream, then you want to try to have those, everything flowing through that value stream smoothly, eliminating all the waste and having everything just add value. So you want to make, you want to have things going smoothly. You don't want to have things blocked and not flowing smoothly. And then when you can get to that point, and we're going to go through each of these five steps in more detail, then you want to be able to have the customer pull that. So you'd like to be able to, rather than, there's pull and push, okay? So the push mentality is, I'm going to build airplanes, or I'm going to build spacecraft, or I'm going to do engineering calculations, or whatever you do. And you're thinking about just doing your work. The pull process is that you're responding to what the customer demand is. So the customer wants the airplanes, the customer wants your calculations, you know, the customer wants your widgets or whatever. And you're trying to, you know, get that to them just as they want it. They're, they're pulling it from you, okay? And then once you get to that point, then you just keep making it better. As George says, do a value stream map, and that's the current state. 18 months later, you can probably do better, okay? Lean thinking is an endless journey. It's a journey of just continuing to improve continuing to improve. As Al mentioned, this is the sixth version of this course we've done. Okay, actually the first version worked really well. We got fantastic student reviews on the very first version, but we've made it a lot better. Okay, so those are the five fundamental principles of lean thinking. We'll come back to them several times in the course. So, okay, now what's value and non-value added? And as I said, this is particularly hard for engineers because we don't, it's, it's not quantitative. Try to remember this. A value-add act, value activity has three tests. One was, does it actually transform or shape whatever's in the value stream, material or information? Okay. Is, it actually, is it just moving the material from one place to another? Is it taking it from one warehouse to another? Or is it actually reshaping in that process? If it's just moving it, it's not adding any value. If it's reshaping it and changing it, then it's adding value. So it has to actually do something to it. Secondly, do you do it right the first time? This is the quality. This is the fundamental thing about quality. Okay. Do you do the right, or do you have to go back and do rework, as we heard about sending it back to Norway? And finally, is what you're doing something the customer wants? Okay. So those are the three tests. Now, if it doesn't satisfy those tests, then it's a non-value add activity, and there are two versions of this. Let me put them both up. Let's start with this one first because it's a little easier. It's, you're doing something to it, but it adds no value in the eyes of the customer, and it's just pure waste. It's waiting, it's, it's idle, it's sitting there, and just sitting idle. Nothing's happening to it. It's sitting there for months and months, nobody's working on it. Or it's going into inventory and waiting, or it's being reworked, or we got 27 signatures that are being checked off, okay? That's pure waste. Add, it, nothing useful is being done at all, but it's consuming resources. In the middle category is what we call necessary waste. It's consuming resources, but it can't be eliminated based on the current technology or policy or thinking. So, um, Mark, Mark, is it? Mark brought up this question. How do we know whether it's worth investing that money to get the number of signatures from 27 to 4? Okay. You're going to have to do some kind of, of um, cost-benefit analysis or something, and maybe get a team together to fix it, okay? If you think of that, the customer doesn't care that you're doing that, okay? But that's a necessary step to actually deliver the value to the customer. So the customer doesn't want to pay you to do that study to reduce the cost of signatures, but eventually, by doing that, you're going to be able to reduce the cost of the product to the customer, okay? So we have an activity which doesn't add value in the eyes of the customer, but is necessary to complete your job. So example is project coordination. If you all go to a meeting uh, Monday morning to coordinate working on the project, the customer doesn't care about that meeting. That's not in the contract that you'll have a meeting on Monday morning. Please deliver me the results of the meeting, okay? But if you don't go to that meeting and you all work on the wrong things during the week, that would have been a big mistake, okay? So the coordination meeting by itself is not something the customer wants, but it's necessary waste. Or maybe you have to satisfy some regulatory things, environmental concerns or worker standards. This should actually be company mandate. Uh, can someone make a check that this should be not the customer mandate, the co company mandate? Maybe the company has some policies or it's legal. What you want to do is you want to get rid of this stuff 
right away. It's not doing anything useful. You want to continually work on minimizing this stuff, and you want to emphasize this stuff. Carol? Yeah. I'd be interested if the class would tell us whether they think inspection is a value-added task or not. Think about that. Inspection. Is inspection a value-added task or not? Well, if it catches a mistake, you can say it was a value-added test. But if you can go design the process right the first point, maybe you don't need to inspect. You can get rid of the inspection instead. So yeah, the good one to get to is uh, filling out a time card for the payroll. American Airlines doesn't care one iota yeah. for you to do that. I mean, if, if they bought the airplane for $125 million, that's all. They're going to write you a check for that. That's it. And, but we all know that we have to, in fact, yeah. if you're going to get paid, you have to fill out a time card. <laughs> Okay, let's keep going. These are good, good examples. Here's an example of, of, actually, this is it. There you go, George, inspection. Okay, mistakes are, mistakes are, inspection is an example of waste. Okay, bingo, we just covered this one. Okay, an inspection by itself doesn't add value. Okay, okay, value stream. So that's value, now let's move on to value stream. So a value stream is all the activities that create the value. It starts with the raw materials, or initial information and it ends with the going to the customer. So the value stream are all these activities that you, you receive some customer needs or requirements or schedule so the customer specifies what they want and then you, you know, do these activities which transform that material or information uh, to the customer. Now let me, this being a group of engineers, let me say that in manufacturing you're usually transforming material. It's easy to see. In engineering you're actually transforming information. You're doing designs, you're doing analysis, you're that type. So we work with information. Information is very hard to see. Okay, so one of the challenges of applying lean thinking to engineering is to realize that you're transforming information. Okay, so what that's what says. What moves in a value stream in manufacturing material moves in engineering or travel requisitions, information's moving. As we've mentioned, Lean thinking is being applied a lot to healthcare, and there people are moving. Okay, you're transforming the person, so the person is what's good in the value stream. And actually, in education, that's what it is too. Hopefully, we're adding value in these three days to you. Okay, we're trying to transform you in some positive way, uh, and that's what we're doing. So you're our value stream for now. Okay, uh, this comes pretty much straight from Toyota. Uh, they, they identified what are the different categories you should look in for waste, um, and they came up with seven categories. So producing more than what you need. Uh, we often do this in spades in engineering. We crank out lots of numbers, okay, whether we need them or not, because we can do it, right? I mean, boy, that's great. I mean, I, I can give you anything you want, and so I'll just do that. Well, that's, that's not, maybe not adding value. Uh, you. You generate information and put it in, into inventory. Now again, let me put this in the engineering context since you're engineers. Uh, you do the calculations, you do them three months ahead of time and save them. Boy, you're, you're, you're really good. Well, the trouble with that is three months later, the world's changed and your calculations may have to be redone because they're obsolete. There's new information or something. So they lost value sitting in inventory. Okay. Transportation, you're just moving things. Um, uh, you know, maybe you carry the report across campus and put it over there, and then later on you carry it back, and so on. If you get rid of those steps, those are non-value added steps. Uh, unnecessary movement is um, you bring everybody together for your meeting here, and you found out you really didn't do that. You could have done it virtually. You took a lot of time to bring people together here. They had to walk across campus, spend 15, 20 minutes doing that when in, you could have done it, you know, in some virtual mode or by telecon or something like that. Waiting, sort of, you know, you, you're ready to do the next uh, job, and, uh, but the person, your, your supplier, you're a customer for somebody, they're the supplier, uh, they haven't given you the information yet, so you just wait an extra couple days because uh, they haven't done their work, and that's wasted time. Defects, I think that's pretty clear. You, you, you make mistakes and, and, and those mistakes propagate in the system and create other mistakes or over-processing. You, you calculate 16 digits when you're not sure whether the first one's right or not. Okay? Or these view graphs, you know, you keep working on the view graphs to make them better and better, but really it's not adding any value. Okay, so that's value stream.
quickly. Flow, to get now, you, now that you've kind of identified which value A you want to get to flow. So here, we need to think about time, because flow is, has a connotation of something's moving in time. Controlling the process, you know, making sure things are done in sequence. Eliminating uh, bottlenecks and stoppages, and eliminating unplanned rework. Now, in, in engineering, there's often a lot of iterative loops, which are necessary, because you have to start with some approximation, do a calculation, do another approximation. You know, those ones, if you think them carefully, are okay, but it's the unplanned ones that you do. You did the calculation, but you forgot to do something, so you gotta go back and redo it. That's unplanned. Okay, so in looking at flow, and this is a change in mindset, the kind of thing George was talking about is difficult. You wanna look at not what you're doing, but what's going in the value stream, okay? So if you have a company that has a lot of different departments, and they're only, your, the department's only thinking about their job, you're gonna have a hard time. What you have to look is what's going through those departments. So you have to kind of, as we would say, strap yourself onto the activity. You think of going with it, you know? And, and that's how to think about flow. So you have to go, and George mentioned this, he said Lockheed and Northrop Grumman and the supplier in Norway got together, they went beyond the walls of Northrop Grumman, okay? They, they had, you have to do that, you have to go beyond these these walls you're used to working within. Okay, time. So it's an essential metric for lean improvement, and there are different ways to measure time. There are different kinds of time, and we're gonna go through these different times. There's wait time, processing time, cycle time, and lead time, or customer demand time. And um, different organizations have different definitions. There's not universal definitions for these things. So if you're in a group, you know, agree on your terminology, and we'll see this in a minute. So, so the important thing is you're all using the same mental concept for the words you're using, okay? And uh, it may not be exactly what you see here if you go to work in an internship somewhere this summer. You know, make sure when they talk about cycle time, ask them, okay, what's your definition of cycle time? You'll probably find out nobody can give it to you, <laughs> okay? But ask them. Okay, so we'll give you the ones. Wait time. Wait time is the time that there's work in process. Something's going through, a job's going through this value stream, and that's called work in process. And wait time is it's just sitting idle. Nothing's happening to that. It's in a queue, it's in storage, uh, or some other place. And so sometimes, these are some other names that are, we'll use the word wait time, but some other names that other places might use are queue time or delay time. Okay, so if we have a typical process here, it's not unusual to find a lot of time things are just waiting to be worked on, okay? Then processing time is, is when you're actually doing something. So it's time that activities are being performed on that work and process. And it may consist of value added time and non-value added time in the color code we talked about before. So that's processing time. And here are some other names that people use. Touch time, in process time, response time. Okay, and then cycle time. Now cycle time is the time it takes to actually execute those activities in a process from beginning to end. And you have to define what the boundaries of your process are. So cycle time is the boundaries of your process. Okay, so it may be a single task. You may talk about what the cycle time of my single task is or a group of tasks, a single process or a group of process. So you have to talk about the cycle time to do something. And it includes the processing time and the wait time. Here are some other needs. So in this particular uh, diagram, the end-to-end -end time is the cycle time. We have wait time, non-value-added processing time, and value-added processing time. Your sheet that I gave you, the sheet for your exercise, has a bunch of times here, okay? Now, a caution is these times are calculated differently. Sometimes it's a caution, sometimes it's a time to cook a hot dog, and sometimes it's a time to cook an to fill an order. How many hot dogs are in the average order? Two, okay. So you have to convert all these times from, to the time per order. It's the right hand column is time to complete an order, okay. And now I'm gonna ask you, since we're short of time, I want, the first thing is, is for you guys to decide on a process by how you're gonna do this calculation, because otherwise it'll take us too long. So you got, six to seven people at a table, okay? So maybe you can allocate 
some results, uh, some, some allocate some, some activities. So here's one way. You might have one member who's just going to write the answers on the flip chart. You might have, uh, you might take, uh, you might divide up the work here and say give one person, calculate the, the, site, the time per order for the first two things and for the another person for the next two things. Okay, this is additive. They can be done independently. And then, uh, and then you got to add them all up for the, what the total cycle time is. So the first thing I'd like you to do is just agree on the process you're going to use at your table to do this calculation, then do the calculation, and then we'll give you your answers, and then we're going to stop and go on our, uh, get ready for our trip. Do we have a total time? 340. 340, okay. You guys have a total time? 420, okay. Good. Hey, well, first of all, I want to congratulate you doing that under a time constraint. Um, I'm going to hand out the instructor's solution, which came out 446. So, okay. Uh, now, let me say the process map, there's nothing particularly unique about this drawing. It could be done somewhat different ways. Um, we'll, we'll get to it in a slide coming up a little bit later, so let's not look at that. But let's look at the cycle time calculations which is this sheet here. Um, so before we, before we left and went and saw that great New Balance tour, we came up with these cycle time calculations. Um, so you can see, and, and the instructors came up with 446. So let's just kind of look at where some of those variations might be. So the first one on step one is taking the order 60 seconds spent per customer. So time per order is 60 seconds. That's pretty straightforward. And then Sasha takes the orders and puts on Andy board, Andy's board. It sits there for 30 seconds, so that's another 30 seconds. Then the time spent to produce the cooked hot dog is 50 seconds. And the average order is two hot dogs. So we came out with 110 seconds. Then it takes 20 seconds per dog to put the um, to wrap it and put, put it in the container, put the fruit on. So that's uh, 40 seconds, but now 10% of them are rejected and have to go back through that. Excuse me, that was back up 110 seconds. I missed that. That's right. So step three is 50 seconds to cook a hot dog. Two hot dogs is 100 seconds, but then there's 10% reject. So, that, so we added a 10% penalty on there. And the same with step four. 20 seconds per hot dog, two hot dogs per order is 40 seconds. 10% penalty is 44. Um, same, and then is, we got to check and see if the order is complete. That's 10 seconds per hot dog. See if it has fruit on it and so on. So that's 22 seconds. Uh, it sits 30 seconds on the counter, but 10% of them go through that a second time. So that's 33. Uh, Sasha does a final check. Again, she's got a. Uh, check that and 10% of reject that's 11 so now we're past the rejection state on step 8 Sasha adds the beverage uh, 10 seconds per order Ch Sasha delivers it to the customer chats it up a bit it's 30 seconds and then we got this kind of extra work that isn't done in cycle it's not it's you know done in parallel as the southwest team said there 10 minutes per hour and they're uh, <laughs> I've forgotten how many orders there are per hour right now. But anyway, it works out to 48 seconds per order. So the instructors came up with 446 seconds. You could do it maybe a little bit differently, but certainly, you know, particularly steps 10 and 11, you might not know how to account for those. But that's, that's what we came up with. Okay. So let's use that as a baseline. Okay, so that completes that exercise. Now, the rest of this lecture you're going to see um, <laughs> We heard a lot of it while we were up in uh, Lawrence at New Balance Shoes, but let's keep going. So we talked about value. We heard about value streams. Boy, now they've, isn't it interesting, New Balance, they've organized themselves by value streams. They don't even talk about departments or function anymore. We got this value stream and that value stream. And I've heard that in other organizations too, that they're organized by value streams. So it's kind of an organizational principle. I think you told me they have uh, five. Five value streams. Yeah. yeah. So we're now on flow, um, and we're on these, just to back up here a second, you know, we're looking at cycle time, process, wait time, so we're time, process, and wait time, cycle time. Uh, 
A lot of organizations will, will map out these called time value charts, actually map out for a particular uh, value stream what all these times are and go measure them. And now it's, it's uh, uh, you know, people walk around with stopwatches <laughs> and actually measure how much time is it taking to do this, how much time is it sitting in inventory, how much of the time is it waiting for somebody to approve, and you make these these time value charts and map it all out. And it's not unusual to see this much kind of red on a time value chart that nothing of any value is being done to whatever is going through the value stream. So, um, Al, I don't, you know, I heard some things in the early days of aerospace that there'd be some component, you know, going on to an aircraft and it would be, you know, like 5% of its time, was there any value added activity going on to it? 95% of the time it was sitting on some dock or some The two biggest wastes we always talk about were move and queue. The extra transportation time that we really didn't need because the stuff wasn't where it was supposed to be, and the queue time waiting to, for a mechanic to be able to start doing something, and the mechanic had to make sure he had the tools, the instructions, the, paper, the, the papers and the part yeah. and the tools. Yeah, so that's where you want to start. What you want to do is get rid of that. As I said before, we went to New Balance. We're not talking about making the people work twice as fast. That's not, that's not where the payoff is. The people are probably working pretty good already. What you want to do is get rid of these, these activities that just are not contributing to anything. Okay? And so their big cycle time savings come from reducing the wait time and the non-value added time. Okay, some tools. Kitty, now we didn't see this up at, at New Balance um, because they weren't really doing assembly. This comes in more when you're doing assembly, when you're getting parts from different locations that have either been bought from suppliers or uh, manufactured before you get to final assembly. Uh, but it's typical in assembly that you get a bunch of parts in and you got to put them together. And one of the lean tools is to, is to kit those, put those, all those parts needed for one item you know, whatever it is. We, in aerospace, you usually call it a ship set, but it could be anything. Put all those in a kit, and um, the kit is a, often made out of styrofoam, and it has the shapes cut out for the parts, and the wrenches that go with it might be right there. Everything you need to install comes to you in one, one package. And instructions are right there to you on the top left corner. Yeah, yeah, the instructions, work instructions are right up here. And, um, so, you so the person doing the final assembly doesn't have to run all around and collect all this information and get it in one place. This is a huge savings. And often suppliers will deliver things in the kits. They come right to the factory in the kits. Now, we didn't see that in New Balance because they really weren't doing final assembly so much. Mistake proofing. Uh, another way to in enable flow is to eliminate mistakes. Uh, mistake proofing is just designing things so it's, it's impossible to make a mistake. Mistakes happen. I, can tell you that from first-hand experience last week in my house. Okay, so you get to flow. Then the next thing you want to get to pull. We heard that up at New Balance, the customer pull. Okay, so no one produces a good or service until someone downstream requests it. Actually, it was a great question that came up. I don't remember who answered it in the final session to Claudio. You know, if you can, do you ever find out you produce more than you need? And he says, yeah, and we stop, you know, until we need that, okay? Uh, because th that's not being pulled by the customer. So that goes into inventory, stuff sitting in the inventory, costs you money, you have to put it in, you have to take it out, you have to rent the space for it. And oh, by the way, while sitting in inventory, it's getting obsolete, so you don't want to do that, okay? So you want to respond to pull. And so, you know, the ideal system is almost what we heard there. The customer goes into the store and says, I'd like a pair of these New Balance shoes the store calls up New Balance. New Balance says, we'll make them tomorrow, and they send them out. I mean, that's, that's kind of almost the ideal situation. Okay. And, yeah. What happens if you have an unanticipated surge in demand? You know, I mean, okay, with shoes, you can produce them the next day, but you know, with larger systems, you can't. So. Well, that's, you know, that, you're right. And, uh, so you have to figure out what is your surge capacity, you know, how much, how much uh, excess capacity do you have in the system 
to meet that surge. And you probably have enough to meet you know five percent or ten percent, but if you get fifty percent, then you're gonna have to add more lines. Well, he's happy on the J Dam, for example. Yeah, or well, the MRAP, you know, the, these new uh, armored vehicles to replace the Hummers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a huge demand, and the numbers keep fluctuating. But they wanted like seventeen thousand of them between the Army and the and the Marine Corps. They've changed those numbers. The Marines are going to cut it down. But they've got like five contractors now trying to make them. And there's that tremendous demand, save lives and all that. But there are lead times for forgings, lead time for machine parts. You know, it just takes so long to do it. And no matter, you know, it's one of those things that we wish we had uh, thought about it earlier. So that's, that's part of it. Sometimes you can't react to the demand. So, but this last bullet's important uh, is that pull systems are more agile and responsive because they, you have to design them to be that way. So you can't meet all situations. There's going to be a certain amount of tension there. But a pull system is better than a push system where you make as many as you can, hope somebody's going to buy them. OK, so uh, here are some things that once you get flow to move to pull. OK, ooh, anybody hear about tack time up there in Lawrence? <laughs> OK, OK, balanced work, standard work, single piece flow, Kanban. OK, and then we, I mean, we heard all those terms up there. And then what we didn't hear too much was just-in-time delivery of all inf material. But in, a, in a, a pull system, you want the, the suppliers who send you the material to deliver it the day you need it, or the hour you need it, or whatever your time period is. So Toyota's suppliers are right outside the Toyota plant. And Toyota doesn't receive shipments and put them somewhere and then move them to the factory to the assembly line. They just receive the shipment. They go right to the assembly line. OK, so how do you create the, well, what's the strategy? You, you want to know, you want to think of the customer and work backwards through the system to figure out how long it's going to take you to respond to the customer. If the customer's lead time, a certain lead time you have with the customer, you heard it could be as short as a day at New Balance. Uh, if your cycle time is less than the lead time, then you can meet the customer demand. If your cycle time is greater, the cycle time it takes you to produce it, greater than lead time, then you're going to need, need some kind of inventory or buffer to meet customer demand. OK, this is, uh, I should let Al do this slide. If I do it injustice, tell me this is Al's slide, actually. But you know, Dell Computers is kind of the classic example of this. You, know, you call them up, place an order, and when they get the order, the suppliers know immediately you've ordered it. Oh, by the way, you give them the money okay, with your credit card number. So they're making the computer not on money they borrow from the bank, but on the money you've given them. The suppliers are online. They know right away. They start working on the computer, and it's shipped in a day. Okay, So Dell was a, a, a great pull system. OK, this tack time we heard, what is it? Tack time is, uh, it comes from the German word for, I think it was the, uh, like the metronome or something. Yeah, and like tachometer, you know. It's yeah. OK. So it's like a drum beat for the process. So what it is is the, the time that you have available, say a day, and the, the customer demand for your shipment. And that means you've got to make one of those every tack time to meet the customer demand. OK, so let's work through an example. Yeah, just uh, while you're talking about that, uh, I mean, I'll give you a real example. You heard me refer to the Apache for the Army. And uh, uh, when we were at peak production, the, we had 21 production days in a month. If you take 30 days and you take the weekends out, it's like 21 days in a month. And the Army wanted 144 a year, which is 12 a month. So that says every 21 days we had to produce 12. And that says that we had to produce one every 1.75 days. And that Apache line moved every 1.75 days. And that's it. OK, so that's a good example. And so here. It's just another example. 235 days a year, 40 orders. The tack time is 235 divided by 46 days. OK, so for our uh, hot dog stand, we got fif for 50 customers, what's our tack time? Well, 50 customers in a day. So what's the time in the day? We got how many hours? Four hours times how many minutes per hour? 60. OK. So that's uh, 240 minutes and 50 customers. So that works out to be 4.8 minutes. We have to hit a tack time of 4.8 minutes per hot dog. That's not, you know, if you can't cook a hot dog in five minutes, you know, <laughs> you're not going to be in business too long, okay? 
But now if we go up to 75 customers, okay, then it's going to be the same. For, this is for 50. For 75, it's going to be 240, oops, divided by 75. So that means we've got to get the tack time down to 3.2 minutes. Okay, now what's our cycle time? Our cycle time is 446 seconds. So, oh, okay, 7.43 minutes. So let's come back. We'll come back to that in the next module and look at that. But our cycle time right now is uh, longer than our tack time, but we have two people working. So if we work that through, we'll find out we can meet the customer demand. Okay, one of the ways to get a poll is to have balanced work. We heard that up in uh, Lawrence. Okay, so if we're going to have a cycle time of 30 days, but we have to deliver something in six days, what do we do? Well, we want to have we want to have a sequence of six-day operations, and so everything every six days moves. And once we start the system, you know, then every six days something comes out. And what we do is we have balanced everything, balanced work. Everything is taking six days to do, and so we can we can all run to the drumbeat. And we heard that up in Lawrence, where they said that. Uh, uh, at least on the tour I was on, that they were, um, uh, they'd, they'd added some work at one of the workstations, so they had balanced work across the workstations. So that you notice they were all kind of moving about the same time. Okay, that's balanced work. So you want to balance the work amongst the different operations to all operate at the tack time. Standard work, one way to do that is to, is to get everything down to a standard process so that there's not a variation. Uh, from operator to operator or from line to line so that everything's operating at the same level. Okay, and that gives you repeatability. And then single piece flow. Uh, this we heard much more about up there than I want to describe here, but the idea is, you know, they, they've reorganized themselves from doing a bunch of batch processes of making a lot of components at, and then just piling them up to having them all in those U-shaped cells so they get single piece flow. And one of the big advantages of that is if there's a mistake, you find it right away, rather than creating a whole batch of, of parts and then finding the next day they're all wrong and you have to throw them out and redo them. In single piece flow, you find out in the next operation that there's something gone amiss with that, with that process, that production system, or maybe the machine's out of balance, or the worker's not feeling well, or whatever. You find out right away, and so you avoid the scrap and rework. Kind of question. Yeah. Isn't there a compromise though going to single piece flow? Because if if they were making a different color shoe every single piece, they'd have to constantly be changing the color of the thread and the sewing machines and that sort of thing. So isn't there a compromise in terms of the types of retooling you have to do? The the, the lower and lower number of Yeah, well, one of the things you want to do is get the 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 the, the, ex, the the change very quickly. So you know you could change quickly between the two threads. So if you have to use different color threads for different shoes, if you can make that change very quickly, then it's okay. And if you can't make it quickly, then you can't do that kind of single piece flow. So this led to, this was a big breakthrough at Toyota where they did what they called single minute exchange of dye, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Where they could, ex they could change out the dye shape in the stamping machine in one minute so they could respond to that type of change. That, that new balance there, in answer to a question, you said that it was, it was a, a big deal, multi-hour thing to change uh, the model of shoe, but they could change out the size of shoe very quickly. Yeah, just a couple minutes. So, yeah. Okay, we heard about Kanban. I mean, we, I mean, we saw this up there. Here we got a. a we need, we have a need for a part. That parts in a, what we call a, in this particular case a supermarket. It's not always this way, but supermarket. Take the part out, and then whoever is Supplying those parts, see, oh, we have an empty shelf in the supermarket, we'll put those parts back in, and that's a Kanban system. There are other kinds of Kanban systems, uh, but they all follow the same basic principle that, that the, the production or supply of a component is done in re response to the demand of the next station in the sequence down the line, so that you're always pulling things through. Now, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is you would do a forecast, and you say, I'm going to need so many parts in March and so many parts in April, and then you order them, and maybe you get some uh, discounts because you order big parts. They all show up in April, and you don't need them. Okay, and so that that's that's the opposite system, and that's usually not very, that's usually very wasteful. 
Visual control, another thing for pools, make things visible. We saw that up in, uh, up in Lawrence with the, you know, the goals for the day and the boards and so on. Uh, make things visible so everybody can understand what the situation is. And a particular instance of that is called an andon light, which is a, a group of lights that indicate whether the process, that current process, that's, that activity on the production line is performing well or is getting out of whack. And we didn't see this up there too much in, in New Balance because uh, everything was going smoothly. But there were some lights up there if you looked. And typically what you see in a lean factory is uh, red, yellow, green lights. And if, if everything's going smoothly, everything's green. And you can look out, you can look across the whole factory and see everything's going through. As soon as there's a problem, if it's just going to be a little problem and not a serious problem, you pull the yellow light and somebody comes, the supervisor comes or the flow coordinator, whoever it was, they called it flow coordinator up there, will come and say, do you need some help? What's happening? They say, yeah, my machine's getting out of whack or I'm running out of thread or whatever. And then if it really gets serious, it becomes red. And when it's a red light, the production line stops. And when the production line stops, and in, in Toyota, one of the big things that came out of Toyota was every worker can stop the whole production line. And uh, somebody comes and helps them, figures out what's wrong, gets it fixed, and gets the production line running. And usually what happens is once you set up this kind of system, you don't have much stoppage because you respond ahead of time with the yellow light or make sure that things are working OK. OK, lastly is to pursue perfection. And uh, this is just the process of continuous improvement. So you, you just want to continually look for waste reduction uh, make sure that everybody can see what's going on so that they can bring their suggestions forward uh, to continuously improve the system. And I think George mentioned the five whys, or maybe Claudio did. I think it was Claudio mentioned the five whys. The five whys is when you ask somebody, why isn't something working, whatever they answer they give you, why do you say, well, why is that? And why is that? And why is that? You try to get back to what the root cause is, not, not the first apparent cause, but the root cause. And so this is the example that, that uh, people use a lot. So why is the Jefferson Monument deteriorating? It gets washed too much. Okay, so why does it get washed too much? Well, it always has bird droppings on it. So why does it have birds droppings on it? Because the birds come to the monument to feed on the spiders. You know, well, why do they come feed on the spiders? Because the spiders are feeding on the gnats. And why are the gnats there? Because the lights are left on all the time. So the reason the Jefferson Monument is deteriorating is because the lights are left on all the time. <laughs> okay. So this is an example of the five whys. It's called root cause analysis. Just keep, if, in average, if you ask at least five questions, you'll get to the, what the root cause is, why something's happening. And that's part of the pursuit of perfection. OK, so these are some of the lean concepts we introduced so far. Most of these we saw up on, we didn't see this one at, at uh, Lawrence. But they had eight types of waste. I didn't see the board there on our tour that showed the eight waste, but he <coughs> mentioned there were eight waste. Yeah, that was very good, a pictorial. OK. Yes. So they've added one. You know, the, the, the eighth was very interesting. Yeah. It, was, it was associate creativity. Yeah. What was it? Associate creativity. Employee creativity. Oh, too much creativity? No, no, no. The no, no. oh, okay. waste of that. OK. Waste. The waste of associate creativity, OK. Yeah, so that was a new one. But pretty much the rest of these. Uh, we saw up there. Okay, so I think we'll just wrap up here.